Hi guys. In order to keep the show ad free and increase the frequency of production, donations are a big help. Some of you have been very generous in donating, and I appreciate it greatly. If you could give to the show's Patreon account, it would result in good karma and buttress the show's prospects. The URL is www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash leader one, L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E, www.patreon.com slash leader one. Thank you so much. Monsters. Um, so yeah, this so this case that we're we're covering it has to do with uh, well we're gonna I'm gonna name the offender first because it pretty much revolves around him. His name is Billy yeah. Schaefer. Um, so yeah, you you kind of have a six degrees of separation kind of connection to him because um, your friend uh, was asked asked out by him and you had the heebie-jeebies about this guy from day one. So I was just wondering if you could, um, if I could, if you could just go back in time to when, like, you first met him, uh, that moment when you just knew something wasn't right with this guy. If you could describe that moment where something about your radar told you this guy's bad news. Well, when when this all went down, um, I was about I was about fourteen. Uh, she was fourteen, I believe. He was sixteen, and we went to the same high school. Um, he was older, um, but he, uh, we saw, we didn't have like the same classes, but we would see him in the halls, you know, cafeteria, that kind of thing. And he, um, I, he took a liking to her right away mm-hmm. and which, you know, was not surprising. A lot of people did. She was fabulous, but, um, he was just very creepy. Um, I don't know how else to say it. Um, he would always kind of just be lurking around like where our lockers were, you know, we were always together and he, I don't ever remember actually having a conversation with him. Um, I literally would just kind of clam up anytime that he approached. Um, he was always telling her like very creepy pickup sort of like, oh, I want to show you a good time. Um, He wasn't asking her out like a teenage boy would. It really felt like, I don't know, it just was not the same. It was, you know, you don't say, I want to take you and show you a good time the way that he did it without, you know, he was, anyway, so, um, you know, he, he bothered her about just on and on and on. She really, truly was not interested, but I think it came to a point that she's like, okay, I'm going to go out with them because maybe then he'll see, you know, that we really don't have anything in common and then they'll let it go. And, um, I just, you know, up until then, I definitely was the friend that kind of rolled my eyes and said, okay, uh, yuck. But, um, once she said, you know, I'm going to go just to kind of put an end to it, I think, you know, he won't be interested anymore or whatever. I literally begged. I begged her not to go. Um, and it actually kind of caused an argument. Um, you know, I think she just didn't understand why I was so against it. Yeah. And I couldn't explain to her that he terrified me. Like there was just something about him that scared the shit out of me. Um, and so, You know, we argued a little. She says, well, you know, are you jealous? You know, he's an older boy, whatever. No, jealousy was not the issue. I said, he just, he freaked me out. 
Yeah. Really bad. She didn't. Um, she didn't possess the intu the intuition that you had. She just saw him no. as a. She just found him unappealing, but she didn't see what you saw in him. Right. I think like she was the sweetest person, so I think that she definitely did not find him appealing. But I think that she kind of almost felt sorry for him because he was just so persistent. Like I think she felt bad for just saying no constantly. Um, so I think she's, you know, I don't know. I just got that vibe from him that like, he's definitely not wanting to take you to a movie. Okay. You don't say, I want to show you a good time yeah, yeah. by taking you to a movie or to meet your grandma. No, like no. it's, you know, but she, I don't think she, she saw it that way. I think she just felt kind of bad for him. He was just kind of a loner. Um, you know, you never really saw him hanging out with anybody he was just a weird guy. Um, and yeah, as soon as she said, I think I'm going to go, I kind of just freaked out. I said, like, I, I literally begged. I said, please do not go. Like, just don't do it. Did she end up going and, uh, on the date with him? No, she ended up, she was very, she was annoyed with me. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I was just as persistent, you know, and I just was like, you know, going to be, like a little child hanging onto her leg saying, do not leave. Um, and she finally was like, fine. Okay. I'm not going to go. Um, and I think, you know, after telling him no so many times, he finally kind of just stopped, you know, he would still look at her in the hall, giving her, you know, the look like, ugh. but, um, he eventually kind of backed off and it was not long. It, I would just, it was within just a couple of months, all of this happened. And oh, so he, and he, he eventually left her alone or did he harass her in any yeah, way? Yeah, I mean, he still, you know, he did for a while. He did for a while, but I think he, he finally, you know, got tired of the same no, thank you, you know, kind of answer that she would give. Like she was kind. She was, she was, she was kinder than I would have been. Um, and I think he finally just got tired of asking and being shot down. So, yeah. you know, he would say hi, but he, he stopped asking eventually. And now did you, this town that, uh, that you and your friend and he lived in, you, was that a small town? You know, it actually, um, it's funny because at that time and at that age, it really felt like it was like the big city um, to us. It felt like we lived in this huge city, but I really think um, it wasn't very large. It was population, maybe like 25,000 or so. Yeah. Um, and she, well, it, they, they both lived um, in the town. And then I lived, there were a lot of little towns, you know, on the outskirts. I lived in one of those. So it was like 10 minutes away. Um, it felt huge, but no, it really was. It wasn't that big. <laughs> this is the town of Upper Arlington, Ohio. No, this was Zanesville. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I have a different address. I'm looking at the the uh, websites where I was uh, doing the research for the case. Uh, did you know the West family, uh, the victims' family? Did you know them? Um, so that was like another kind of weird thing. Um, the the there was a guy, and it was just a very, like, very removed kind of Kevin Bacon kind of way. Um, I was dating this guy, um, and his best friend, that we were always over at the best friend's house, and the best friend's mom, I know this is like one of those long drawn out things, but the best friend's mom was actually dating Kevin, and that's who he was out with the night that this all happened. Wow. Um, oh, my God. So you, so you, you, yeah, you, I mean, it was just very, it was just very weird. So you got to see the effect that, that this crime had on the whole family, did you? Like, I mean, I, I, th I mean, I guess by then you, I, you didn't know them as well. But I honestly, I never saw Kevin again after that. Um, I know that uh, the girlfriend, they did stay together for a little while. Um, they, it hit her very hard. Obviously, like she had probably spent you know, a lot of time with the kids and stuff, whenever they were with him. But, um, 
it just hit everybody really hard. Um, oh, without doubt. You know, this man. town, this town, you know, sure, there was crime. I mean, it's not, it's not this terrific upstanding town. I'm not going to lie. But um, there was lots of crime. But something like this was just, it was different. You know, oh, it was yeah. so sinister. And it was just not your, your run of the mill, like, you know, just stupid, petty crimes. Yeah, I'm just going to go through the bare bones statistics of the case here. So a five-year-old girl yeah. named Sarah West was sexually assaulted and murdered by her neighbor, Billy Schaefer, who had dated uh, Amber's friend. And uh, her name is Amber, by the way. Amber's friend is the... Oh, is no. The, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, Amber's friend went out with this guy, Billy Schaefer, and he's the one who perpetrated this horrific crime. Um the offense I have listed is aggravated murder, but there was a, a sexual assault. There was a sexual assault involved uh, that was part of the crime. He's gotten a sentence of 20 years to life, though it seems as though he probably won't make parole because of just of how uh, he didn't express any remorse for what he did. But I'm going to go through it from the beginning. Um, so on February 14th, uh, 1993. So how many years ago is this now? That's uh, 24, 25, 26, 26 28 years ago. Uh, yeah. This happened, yeah. This last Saturday or last Sunday, yeah, 28 years ago. Um, so Sarah and her brother Seth were being babysat by Billy Schaefer. So he was 16 years old at the time. So that's when he dated your friend, right? Oh, when he tried to date my friend. Yeah, yeah. when he tried to date your friend, <laughs> well, I should yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so he's watching a horror movie. So couldn't have made the circumstances couldn't have been worse. He was watching Friday the Thirteenth. They had a marathon on TV, and uh, he he decided to to molest this little girl. Uh, did, so when you whenever you saw this guy around, did he come across like like he's that kind of creepy, like sexual creepy? I mean, the way he the things he said to this girl. I'll show you a good time. Did it seem to have sexual overtones to it? Yes, yes. And he just kind of made, he just, um, I know I keep saying creepy, but I just honestly cannot think of a better adjective for him. He was just kind of this slimy guy. Um, and it wasn't, I know there's a lot of, well, you know, maybe not now, but back in the day, they were always talking about what he wore and his appearance and um, all of these things. And it, it wasn't any of that. I mean, I, I'm i just as white trash as the rest of us. So, like, you know, it, Me too. <laughs> that had nothing to do with it. It was just yeah, yeah. the way that he came across. Um, and he, this is so mean, and I know this is not his fault, but he looked like, if you look at his arrest photo, he looked like a man in his 30s. He did, yeah. It's just, it, it was very weird. Like, this was a 16-year-old boy, but he did not look like a, you know, he, he, it, he kind of was like, it was like this creepy old guy, you know, pretending to be a high school kid is what it felt like. <laughs> wow, yeah, that is creepy. It, I mean, I know, you know, and that's awful, Like, but it's just, it was true. It was just, he was, he gave a lot of people the creeps. Oh yeah, so he um, he decided to molest this little girl Sarah, and so uh, she was asleep at the time. And then he uh, took her out of her bed and uh, molested her. Um, and just to give some background on Sarah, so she was described as precocious and loved tea parties and dolls and uh, Cinderella and. Uh, was very fondly remembered by your family and friends. How was it that people like that always seem to become victims yeah. of people like this? It's always it's always like the the angelic types, you know. Um, I mean, that's how she was described. Right, you know? right. Um, so the pictures of her just it breaks your heart. She's like the perfect little girl. Oh yeah, you can tell you just by looking at her. Yeah. Whereas you you look at him, he looks troubled. He looks like something's not quite right with him. So, right. yeah, she had an excellent relationship with her family. Um, even though the parents got divorced, um, she she went she got uh, she went to live with her mother, 
um, but everything was otherwise fine. So uh, yeah. going going to the time of the crime. Uh, so Kevin West, he had a visitation with Sarah and her brother Seth, and it started out typically as it did with any other weekend where he had them. Um, but Kevin went out on Saturday night on a date, and he hired Billy Joe Schaefer to watch the children. And uh, I guess Kevin didn't have your intuition either. He didn't see anything ab about this guy that was untoward. I, yeah. Or were you about to see that something? That whole situation, as a parent now, and I hate, you know, I don't want to be like victim blaming and all that kind of thing. I'm sure that he has punished himself um, so much over the years. And so it's hard to try to be a nice person, but at the same time, as a parent, yeah. if you saw this kid, he is not someone that would instill trust. Like, he's not someone that you would want around your children, not alone, like, you know, leaving them in the care of. It's just, it blows my mind. Why? Why? Why yeah. anyone would... I just don't understand it, and I never have. Um I guess part of us wants to be complacent. Bad decisions. Like, yeah, we. I part of us wants to be complacent. We don't want our minds to take us there. We don't want to think that that kind of thing could happen to our kids or to anyone in our world. So maybe that right. was part of it too. Just feeling, but you know, I, I guess the guilt came afterwards in in terms of thinking why I why didn't I see the signs? Why didn't I protect my children? But. I, you know, you just can't imagine, yeah. I mean, you know, other people other than you just can't imagine that someone would do that kind of thing, you know? I, I actually, yeah, I've read, you know, before that, you know, people that are like just genuinely really good people, um, you know, their brain just doesn't work like that. Like they don't look at people and, and see that they just, you know, see the good in people or whatever. So you know, and maybe that was the case. Maybe he was that kind of guy that was just, you know, giving everybody the benefit of the doubt, just a genuinely nice guy. And, and you know, that could be. Um, I was I was a kid, um, but I, I just was a very uh, cynical kid, and, and I didn't, hmm. I was very untrusting, so... Yeah, you see, you would have been a really good cop because you, you have an eye for these people, you know? <laughs> yeah, so did, did your friend, when the Schaefer's crime came to light, did your friend finally admit, okay, yeah, this guy's in bad news? Did she, see, did she ever say anything like, I can't believe I didn't see this before? Yeah, she, um, she, the morning that I found out, actually, she was the one that called me, um, and it was early, um, I mean, heck, honestly, I don't know, to a teenage girl, it could have been 10 o'clock, but to me, it felt really early. She called, and she was just crying hysterically. Um, she asked if I had heard what was going on, and I said, you know, I just woke up, I haven't heard anything. And she said, Billy killed a little girl. And I I just, I said, what? You know, like, it just, what? And she's. I don't know how many times she had to say it, but I just felt like, I felt like I couldn't even hear her. I felt like there were just bees buzzing in my ears. Um, and I just remember saying, Billy who? But I knew who. Like, I knew who before she even said. I just had that disgusting feeling. And I'm not sure how she had found out, you know, whether radio or on the news or whatever. Um, she lived very close to where this happened. So, you know word this bad travels fast and but she was actually the one that told me and she was just absolutely hysterical she just kept saying like oh my god what if i would have gone with him oh, um man. you know i wonder so. what i wonder what that does to you when when you i mean she she knew him a little so like to, to know someone and then find out they did something like that i wonder if that led her feeling almost defiled or tainted just by I, associating with him <laughs> I I feel I feel like it definitely would because you know like I said I can't remember ever having an actual conversation with him. Um, I know there was a few times that he would he saw me, 
um, in the hall, like without her and he would ask where she was, um, you know, but like, you know, I never actually had any kind of connection whatsoever with him. And, you know, she did definitely talk to him more than I did. And I mean, just the fact that like, good God, she was going to actually love this guy. Um, and then to find that out, I just remember how horrible it made me feel. I can't, I can't imagine the way that it, mm. that it made her feel. And perhaps one of the reasons Kevin West was able to trust him is that he only lived in that house. Kevin West only lived in that his house for four months. And I guess maybe uh, it just wasn't enough time to really get to know, um, to get to know Schaefer. Right. Uh, there, maybe Schaefer kind of kept to himself in the neighborhood. Nobody really knew anything about him. And again, not everyone's as intuitive as yourself. So, um, uh, you know... No I tend to, to agree. Him. I think that, you know, maybe he just being there, you know, new to the area, so he's not going to really know, you know, all the dirt on this kid. And, you know, people wear very good masks. So maybe, maybe he played it off really well and just acted like this normal, normal neighbor kid that ugh, I can't imagine, but I, that had to have been the case, you know. So I'm going to go through uh, that evening, um, so, so when it started with Schaefer coming over to the home. Uh, so uh, David West let uh, Sarah stay up till 10 because she was like drawing a picture and she wanted to finish it and it's Saturday, so why not? Um, and so she begged, well actually she begged Schaefer to, let, to stay up that late and he let her. Um, so... Okay. Yeah, they were up and out and even a little bit past 10 p.m. and then he put them to bed, and uh, this is interesting. So Schaefer, after putting them to bed, he drinks a beer. He snorted some glue, <laughs> his hot Saturday yeah. night, yeah. And he started watching the movie Friday the 13th. Um, maybe the glue damaged his brain, and maybe that had something to do with it. Um, and so at one point he took some skin magazines into the bathroom and pleasured himself there Good. yeah and mm -hmm. he, he calls a friend down the street and invited him over to see a tattoo gun he made that day so this guy this guy was kind of uh, shady already before this even happened so we we know right. he's kind of a shady character yeah so he went to his friend's place leaving the kids alone um and before he left his friend's house, uh, he brought a handgun with him. So, um, when he got to the friend's house, apparently he stated that he planned on killing everyone in the house. Uh, but he, right. he knew he couldn't uh, overpower four people and decided against killing them. So this guy was just a ticking time bomb, apparently. Um, so, yeah, like, that's just crazy like you know he thought that was a bad choice but he's gonna go and you know like this was a better choice yeah well i mean based on what i've read about serial killers and i've read about many of them by now they, that all seems to be an element where it's just like it seems to rise up in with them and they can't they just keep trying to suppress it and they can't and then it just kind of right. spills over um so let me see yeah so schaefer and Two of his friends went out back of the friend's house, and they fired the gun a few times. Uh, so he uh, left there and went back to the West House. And sometime between 11 and 11.45, Kevin West actually returned to the house briefly because he had been out dancing and he had been sweating and he wanted to change his shirt. And so he did that and uh, checked on the kids and then left about 15 minutes later. Um... So Schaefer watches the, the second Friday the 13th movie and then at one point, and he hadn't finished the movie yet, he decided to, to get Sarah West from her bedroom. So he put her on the sofa and uh, for a while there he wasn't sure what he was going to do. Um, so he takes her up to the weight room and he removed her clothes and he kissed her body. Um, he fondled her uh, with his finger and at one point she woke up and started screaming so uh, she unfortunately she she suffered through this consciously 
Um, and he left her alone in the weight room, just screaming alone. He shut the door on her. And the door was apparently very hard to open for some reason. Yeah. He went to get a knife and he came back to the weight room and began stabbing her repeatedly. And at one point, he bit her thigh and her breast. This is just diabolical. I mean, it just, it sounds it's almost personal. Horrific. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, this is not merely an execution. This is someone who clearly has uh, sadistic and psychotic tendencies. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So he dragged her down the stairs, leaving blood on the walls and on the, the, the stuffed toys that were left on the stairs. He put her in the bathtub. Uh, he cut off her breast and slit her throat. He also cut her body from her pelvis to her neck. And then he was quoted as saying later on, well, then I cut her straight up the front, uh, pulled her uh, skin and stuff away from the slit a little bit and stuck my hands inside her with the knife and started cutting, stabbing. I mean, no, no, this is the, the way he said specific, no sophistic thing I was cutting on. Yeah, so this is this is just a bloody rampage. This is just pure evil, and uh, clearly. <clears throat> so, did you pick up on any like? Did you get the sense he may have been not just creepy but deranged? Like, did it? Did he seem like mentally ill or something? I felt, I felt like, um, up until the point that she said you know, she was going to go with him when she was still saying, no, she wasn't going, you know, it was, you know, I just, I didn't like him. Um, I felt like he was just very uh, scary, uh, which is, was, was kind of, I was kind of funny at the time because like I was the kid that was like, I thought I was a little badass. I was a little punk and I wasn't afraid of anything, but this guy scared the crap out of me. Um, but you know, I wasn't like, crazy persistent until she said she was going to go. And then I just felt like it was dangerous. I felt like it was dangerous. It, it felt like, I don't know. He, he felt dangerous to me. Um, and I, and I even kind of tried to like rationalize with myself, like, you know, seriously, he's just a kid. How dangerous can he be? But, mm -hmm. um, I just, I felt very, very strongly that if she went with him, I just felt like something bad was going to happen. And, and uh, she thought I was completely crazy, but luckily she was, uh, you know, she loved me enough as a friend to entertain my, what she thought was just being crazy. And he just seemed very scary and dangerous to me. And undoubtedly when that kind of thing comes to light, you know, the whole community is a buzz. Anybody who might've known him probably, you know, gave out information, probably I don't know who knows how much of it would have been rumors, but did you end up hearing anything about his background, his childhood? Well, you know what? I didn't until, until this all happened. And then, you know, they like, cause like I said, like when it came to school, um, I don't know of any close, I don't, I don't know of any friends that he had. I'm sure there was somebody, I mean, he went and showed him the, wouldn't sell tattoo guns or whatever, but I never, you never saw him with anybody. Um, so it's not like there was a lot of, you know, people that could have been talking about his past, but when it all came to light, it's like, this dude was damaged. Yeah. He sounded very damaged his whole life. Yeah. I'm wondering if any investigative reporters might've done any digging, but I guess, you know, ultimately if you're, if you're related to someone like that, you don't want to talk about it publicly because it would already bring so much shame on your family. You wouldn't want to divulge anything. So. Right. I mean, they, they had said he entered the system when he was like six years old Yeah. for trying to beat his grandma. And then again, when he was 12 for stabbing his brother and it's just oh, like, God. yeah, it's yeah. Well, the system's goal. And I interviewed a social worker a while ago. I don't know if you heard that episode. But yeah. basically, basically yeah. the way they see it, the ideal situation is that the child should be placed back in the home in different circumstances. But there are some kids who are just so disturbed that 
that's not really a viable option. They really need to be, you know, squared away in an institution, perhaps permanently. And this is, there have been many instances like this where a kid was set free. And actually, I'm developing an episode on Ed Kemper right now. And he he, he yeah. committed murder by the time he was 15. And they released him. They thought, oh, he's doing fine, you know, because he figured out how to manipulate them into thinking he was normal now. And uh, so the system has done this many, many times. That's scary. It's like, you know, you put a good mask on, you can fool everybody into thinking that you're you're fine. I mean, I, I guess I used to, well, hell, I still have so many questions, like, you know, with his parents. Like, if you know that, you, you know, if you knew that he was dangerous and he was just stabbing his brother four years ago, why would you, why would you, you know, let him around little kids or like, but you know what, maybe they didn't know what he was doing that night. Maybe they had no idea. So that's not fair, but oh, it's just, yeah. it's crazy. Cause it's just sounded like it was just one thing after another with this guy. It could have been a matter um, of neglect until as well. it all exploded. Yeah. It could have been neglect as well. Cause in, in a, in a household where there's neglect, things like that, they just, they're just permitted. Anything's permitted. The parents could be on drugs just the kids run wild, and so it's quite... A, right, it's like they don't thing. care what, what the kid's doing. Yeah, exactly. So the kids just are just free-range. They just run wild and do whatever they want. Okay, so... Uh, so I go did. On. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. No, oh, you go on. No, I, I was just going to say, like, I did... Um, when he had come up for parole eventually, his dad did make a statement that was, you know, I respected that, you know, he said if if Sarah can't have her life back, then Billy should never see the light of day again. So he was in support of, of him being locked up forever. And I thought, you know, at least that's something, you know. Well, that's a very difficult position to be in, to have a child. Do you, do you have children? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I have I mean, two. And can you imagine being in the position where your child just did something really evil and yet you still love your child? I mean, that's got to be a hell of a mind fuck, right? Right. I, I cannot, I just can't imagine. I mean, you know, his, I think the only thing I've ever, I've, I've never even read anything about his mother, but it's just the father. And I just feel like, you know, even if, even if there were issues, you know, you would carry so much guilt and so much like, you know, maybe you feel, I don't know. I personally, I would feel, I feel responsible if my kids do something bad. I feel you know, I'm the one that's supposed to teach them how to be good people. And so then if they're not good people, it kind of reflects on me, at least is the way that I feel about it. So I can only imagine um, what the family's going through. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, uh, well, with Billy Schaefer, clearly there was something chemically wrong with him or structurally wrong with his brain. So he just, because he was just a yeah. bad seed from the get go. So going further into the night, uh, yeah, he so he ended up shooting Sarah in the head, um, and according to the coroner, uh, the gunshot probably happened after he assaulted her. Um, so he may have done this after the fact in an effort to mislead people into thinking that that she was dead before he stabbed her, um, as if that would really make a difference in the way people perceived it. Um, right. but, uh, but he definitely did it pre-mortem. Um, so when he was finished, uh, he placed her body, uh, along with all the toys that had the blood on them in a couple of garbage bags and he threw them over an embankment. Um, so after he, he threw her body away, uh, he came back to the house and he staged a robbery. So he removed a window and he threw furniture around to make it look like somebody broke in. He grabbed a bottle of Pepsi and took uh, took her her brother, who was three years old, to a cabin behind the house. Uh, he waited there, uh, debated with himself if he should leave uh, before Kevin West came home. Um, Billy heard Kevin West banging on Schaefer's parents' front door because they were neighbors. So Schaefer ran out of the woods to his parents' house and tried to tell the robbery story in an effort to exonerate himself. Uh, Kevin West ran to the cabin and found Beth, found Seth, sorry, uh, barefoot and shaking. Fortunately, his life was spared. Uh, hopefully, he doesn't remember anything either. Uh, so the police arrived soon after 
and it did not take long for Schaefer to implicate himself. So I guess the police had the same sharp eye you did and could tell just by this guy's countenance that uh, it's not easy to, it's not hard to believe he'd be capable of this kind of horrific crime. So, um, yeah, so I have a record of um, his history here. So before he ever committed this crime, um, yes, as, as you said, he was known to children's services. Uh, when he was six years old, he, um, yeah, he was witnessed getting angry and punching his grandmother in the face. By age 12, he was brought in for stabbing his six-year-old brother four times, and that was while his brother was asleep. So I, how he was released and able to go to high school at the age of 16, I have no idea. Um, his behavior continued to go downhill, and by the time he was in high school, he had drug, alcohol, and behavioral problems. Uh, he openly admits believing in Satanism as a religion and had satanic images on his school books. He also stated his heroes were Jeffrey Dahmer and Charles Manson. Well, how did nobody see the signs? I have no idea. Was was your, <laughs> you, <laughs> was your friend aware? I'm telling of all you, that? it was so obvious. It was it was it was not hidden. It was not a hidden situation. Did she see? I mean, that? he had this earring. He had this upside down cross earring, and he was just like hateful all the time. And just I don't. It blows my mind that this even happened. Did he talk to her about serial killers and how much he admired them? God, I hope, I wouldn't think. I can't imagine her talking to this. She was, like I said, she was very sweet and very, um, uh, I can't imagine having a serial killer conversation with her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, it wouldn't have gone over well. All right, so he gets life. So, yeah, he started talking the minute he got in the police car, though his story changed several times over the next few days. However, all the stories definitely implicated him in some form, um, you know, describing the details I just described, though perhaps not in always in the same order, um, but there was definitely more than enough evidence to implicate him. Um, he was offered a plea deal if he would answer several questions regarding the murder of Sarah West, and he agreed to do that. Um, and they noted two comments that he made during the interrogation were particularly frightening. When he was asked what would have happened if Sarah wasn't there and Seth was the only one in the house, he said, I would have did him. Schaefer was yeah. asked why he killed Sarah. His, his response, I've always thought of doing it and opportunity was knocking. After that final interview, Schaefer pled guilty to aggravated murder and was sentenced to life in prison. And incredibly, uh, he not only does he not consider himself to... Uh, to truly be guilty, or or that the crime there was anything wrong with that crime, but he has sent death threats to the West family to the point where the FBI had the family under twenty four hour surveillance, and he was in prison. See, I don't understand. I've never understood this. You know, I thought that when you were in prison, you know, your mail is monitored, your phone calls are monitored. Like, I don't understand how that went down, but yeah, that's yeah. Wow, I don't get it. Um, and then I think it was something about at least, I mean, um, like they wanted to go for murder one, but the plea deal was, you know, yeah, okay, fine, we'll go down for murder one as long if you tell us the details. And oh, like, unfortunately, unfortunately, he could not get the death penalty penalty for this because if anybody deserves it in my opinion it would be him oh yeah and uh, they just mentioned the police mentioned that uh you know he described all the grisly details of the sexual assault and the murder with uh mm. with no remorse you know he, and not only that but he appeared to be proud of it too you know he considered this yeah. a, that was like his crowning achievement in life apparently uh, so he's been described as a sociopath, a child murderer, a sex offender, and an unremorseful monster. No, no yeah, no kidding. Uh, so releasing him at any point would be a complete injustice to Sarah West and demean his extremely cruel treatment to her. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, well, this is so this is an article from a website called blockparole.com. So I, I think this is probably a cause they have for many cases, and uh, it's no wonder um, this guy is just and it's strange. I'm looking at him now. That I'm looking at a more updated photo of him because uh, I I imagine he didn't have gray hair in high school, right? No, <laughs> no. I've seen I've seen the recent photo and uh, yeah, it's it's. It's crazy. Well, it's weird. He looks. He harmless, still looks but, creepy, but yeah, but way more normal than he used to. At least, um, like I don't know. I, I feel like he kind of looks just like he looks average now. Um, yeah, he does. Yeah. So what was was he into? Like a lot of like metal bands, like Slayer and stuff like that too. Um, I don't remember. You know, and it's I don't remember exactly like what he he had all these patches. He would wear this sleeveless jean vest like and there was all these patches you know different bands or whatever I don't know all over it um and then the the, the earring like the one earring which was like this upside down cross that was way bigger than necessary and um and it was weird because you know I come from like my whole family was all the men, they still had long hair and were like rocker guys, you know, so it wasn't like I was just so different from him that he was creepy to me, but he, um, yeah, I just, he definitely, and he was like one of those, he would, he would have like marker, he would do like different like symbols or whatever on his skin. It would be like either ink or marker or whatever. Um, I had no idea what the hell was written all over him, but he just looked, yeah, it was just crazy. And and so, what year were you fourteen? Oh, it would have been ninety ninety three. I turned fourteen. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm not asking to say how old you were, but uh, no, uh, oh no, yeah, I turned fourteen in ninety three, and um, yeah, it was just actually that he's the my friend was about. What's that? I was 16 that year, so yeah, he's, I guess, the same age as me. Oh, it's just, I can't imagine um, doing anything that horrific um, at, at that age. It's, it's, yeah. I don't know. I just, I, I feel like he was warped. And I think his whole, I think the glue thing, he, they actually tried to use as, like, part of his defense. Like, he, um, you know, for poor kids all burn out from sniffing glue, can't help himself kind of thing, and luckily that didn't work. Um, well, fortunately, he doesn't get to parlay I'm that. sure it didn't help. No, no, I'm sure it didn't. Because, uh, <laughs> well, I think it accumulates in your brain. It can actually like form a membrane inside there, and that's when it starts oh, yeah. real damage. I mean, it is glue, so... <laughs> right. It's, I can't imagine it being... Good, but I can't imagine it's definitely not going to make you uh, do something this disgusting to a little, a little girl. Oh, not at all. Um, so yeah, so did you know more about? Um, you mentioned that her father kind of blames himself, and you say he left town, did he? Or he moved no, um, I I don't have. I have no idea what happened um, after the fact. We actually left town. We actually. Um, we were, we had been planning on moving, um, before this happened. So like this happened in February and we moved in April. Um, and it was very, it was a good move. I mean, I, I, I had a very hard time with this. Um, oh yeah. So it kind of, I think it kind of affected everybody in the community to kind of leave a, leave a taint on the community for a long time. Honestly, that's the way, um, that's the way it felt. I think, you know, just so many people, um, you know, there was either those people that uh, completely get off on and on talking about these things that, you know, and it just, there was so many details flying around and you didn't know what was true and, and what wasn't true and just horrific things. Yeah. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. so much of it did come out to be true, but, um, you know, I think the people with, with a soul like just really didn't she couldn't even bear to talk about it it was just so it was awful um and I was 
I was, uh, it, it kind of, it felt to me like for, for a long time, for years, I didn't understand why it bothered me quite as bad as it did. Cause it just, it just shook me to my core. Like the entire situation that I knew, you know, that I had known somebody that did that and that mm-hmm. it j- just, um, everything, everything about it. Uh, it just bothered me so much, but I think now that I'm an adult, I, I think looking back, I just, it made me feel like my little safe bubble was burst, you know, like it, it just completely, um, you feel nice and safe and secure and like nothing bad, like that's going to happen. That's TV stuff. And then something like that does happen so close. And it, it just definitely affected me. um, So was that community for a long long time? Was that community otherwise very safe? Was there very little crime going on? No, I mean, you know, there was crime, but it wasn't, there was crime. I don't want to, it's, it's not, I feel bad saying it, but like, it's not the greatest town. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really not the greatest town, but this was definitely extreme. You know, like this is not a common thing that goes on down there. Um, You know, and I still, I still have family that lives down there and uh, I go down every now and again to visit them. But um, if it was not for, if it wasn't for having family there, I don't think I'd ever go back because it just, like you said, it just, that whole town just feels very tainted to me. It has never felt the same. And, um, I was very, very glad to, to move away. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can understand it's, that. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, just, um, I was just like, you know, he can't, he may be proud of himself, but he can't parlay it into fame to any extent because you, you Google his name and the country singer, Billy Joe Shaver comes up. So he, so oh he's, yeah, he's being overridden by him. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think he wanted to be like you know infamous. Well, you know, like Dahmer or Manson, and and you can't. It's it's uh, it's difficult to find. Yeah, you know, information. There's maybe two, three articles. You can find the parole stuff um, really easy, and that you know, thankfully, every time that goes around, they petition, and I how I've signed every single one since I've been an adult. And, um, but other than that, yeah, he's not nearly as infamous as, uh, he thought he was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, at least so they'll just, uh, yeah. eventually be forgotten. I hope, I mean, obviously not by her family, but, um, you know, most people yeah, eventually I, forget about it. But I mean, if I you, read an article like her mom just, there was an article and maybe it, honestly, maybe it was like the last parole, uh, situation. Like the, her mom had said that, you know, over the years you start to heal and then time comes and he's up for parole. And so then it kind of opens it all up again. And, um, and so then you have to start healing again. And, um, yeah, it's it's one of those things. Like I, I won't think about it for a long, long time. And then every now and again, you know, like when things are calm and I don't have a whole lot going on in my head, like things I'm worried about or dealing with or whatever, like it'll sneak in, and I just all the questions that nobody will ever have any answers to. You must be really careful about hiring babysitters. I was so, I was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, my husband, oh. my husband actually, um, you know, he was always really careful, but I was, um, yeah, nobody, nobody watched my kids. Like I was so, it definitely stuck with me. It's not something that I forgot. I had a daughter, you know, she's 17 now. And when she was little, I was, she, I wouldn't let her out of my sight. I just, that's, the things I've thought about all the time is you just don't know. So you, you, so did you find it hard to trust her around men? Um, I did actually, but it wasn't, it was from multiple other things pre Billy Schaefer. So, um, and I think maybe that's why I was, I was, um, I was very suspicious of people by the time I was 14, I, I had, 
not had the easiest life. And, you know, maybe that's why I was the way that I was, you know, when it came to people, I wasn't like that with everybody. Um, luckily I was with him, but I just, no, I'm, I'm just not real trusting in general. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like the social work, but definitely not with my kids. Oh yeah. Yeah. The social worker was saying to me, her job affected her so deeply that now when she interacts with children, she's like looking for red flags about potential abuse and she can't just yes. interact with a child and forget about all that kind of stuff. So yeah, these experiences, they do get under your skin, no doubt. They absolutely do. Um, I always thought that I wanted to work with children. I thought, you know, when I, when I get older, I'm going to, I had big dreams. I was going to be a doctor. I was going to be a pediatrician. I was going to work with kids. And, um, yeah, I, I can't, I can't, um, I feel very motherly. I have found out, um, that I can't separate that protective feeling. Um, and you, you know, and it's, you would think that that would be good, but it's not, it's not a good feeling to have if it's a job. So you just, I, I definitely don't work with children. I love kids. Um, I love them, but it's just, I'm too protective. And I, the same, the same thing that the uh, social worker said, you know, you, you, you're looking for things like you, you look for things you look for, little kids that say certain things or if they're afraid of, you know, just anything. And it's, it's not healthy. So. No. Oh, yeah. So what, what do you do? Um, well, I'm a nurse oh, that's um, cool. and I am on the complete other end of the spectrum. Um, and I am in geriatrics. So. Oh yeah. Did you deliberately choose that? Cause if you worked in pediatrics, <laughs> yeah. I I interviewed for a uh, for a pediatric position. Um, it was a burn unit, and I I believe I got the job. But we were going on the tour. Um, it was everything was going great, and as we were walking through the unit, um, I didn't see anybody. We were just walking down this hallway, and the lady that was giving me a tour was giving me statistics of. Um, you know, 80% of the, the children that come in to the hospital with burns, they are, um, you know, whether it be intentional or unintentional, they're inflicted by a parent. Oh, my God. Um, and Cigarette burns, you mean? You know, whether it be, I mean, it, this was like a, a major hospital. Um, so this would be, you know, like a burn unit, like for severe, severe burns. Yeah. And for her to say 80%. Um, you know, at the time I already had my children and I, like I said, I can't separate like the mama bear in me from the nurse. Yeah. So I think I could definitely see myself, you know, being like very protective and wanting to beat the hell out of these parents that came in. And, and I, I, as soon as she told me that, and it kind of sank in like 80%, um, I actually, I, I stopped her and I, I thanked her for her time. And I, I apologized for, you know, I didn't want to waste any more of her time, but I was not going to be the right fit for the job. Um, and ever since then it was like, no, you know what? I, I definitely, I, I should just do something else. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people, who I, up, you know, a lot of people end up working yeah. with children in that capacity end up quitting, you know, like, uh, I know a guy who, He's a social worker. He did the typical social work thing for about six months, like dealing with children, and he, and he quit. He couldn't take it any longer. Yeah, it's it's too much. I mean, I think if you, you know, if the, the people who can do it and do a great job, you know, that's, you know, they're my heroes. That's amazing. Um, I admire that, but I, I personally can't... Um, I can't separate who I am from a job um, when it comes to, to kids. And I, and I also, even if it wasn't for that, I know my personal limits and like what I can take emotionally and what I can't. 
And I think that it would definitely be something like I would be bringing the job home with me. You know, yeah. I would be, I would be bringing all that emotion home with me and that's not, that's not healthy. So yeah, I mean, I'm glad it, I recognize that and I'll just, just stick with the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. If law and order special victims unit was more realistic, most of those characters would have retired years ago. I imagine. Oh yeah. 15 <laughs> years of that. No way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you no end up way. with the. Uh, there's a condition they call compassion fatigue, and a lot of uh, healthcare workers and first responders are in danger of developing it. Did they warn you about that when you were training? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and especially. Um, I mean, with everything going on in the world right now, um, we've done in services basically about this kind of thing, like you know, it. If, if if caregivers are not aware of their limits and uh, basically taking care of themselves and their own mental health, I mean, this whole, you know, things can be so detrimental. It's like you're saving lives, but you're kind of killing yourself. Yeah, it's true. Well, do they provide resources for you to turn to in case that happens, if you get a little burnt out or something? Yeah. Our, I mean, if, yeah, at least where I'm at least where I'm at, they definitely do. I think a lot of places do. Um, yeah, any kind of nursing, any kind of medical right now, I mean, it's just, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, for sure. Well, I thank you very much for doing the show, and uh, it's uh, definitely more enlightening that you actually knew uh, someone who had associated with a killer, and you lived in the area, so that added uh, a lot of extra dimensions to it that are really fascinating and uh, your, your insight has been very valuable as well. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's been a long time since yeah. I brought all that up and I'll just tuck it right back down now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Suppress it again. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Very, thank you. Thanks, Amber. All right. Great. All right. Thanks. Take care. Have a good night. Bye. Bye -bye. You too. You too. Bye.